So as my name is Michelle Miser and I do loan origination at Cambridge Trust. And um, I specifically work with first time home buyers and first time home buyer products. So I just want to let you know that this is the bread and butter of what I do um, and focus on. And so we're going to go through today really talking about what the lender is looking for so that you can think through how you want to be prepared and get ready for getting pre-approved and then subsequently um, getting uh, your first loan uh, to buy your first home. And so today I'm going to cover the difference between pre-approval and pre-qualification, the four C's of lending, which is, is the key things that we're looking looking at in terms of your finances and approving the loan. Different mortgage programs, so these are different um, loans that you could consider to think through which one might be the best one for you as a first time home buyer. We're going to talk about ratios, so that this gets talked a lot by lenders, and that is your debt to income ratio. Um, knowing your lender, thinking about um, you know, where that lender is located, things you might want to know about a lender as you decide how you want to choose. Your lending team, um, you will start working with a loan originator, often called a loan officer, um, but they really are just part of a team. They work with you for your pre-approval and to get your loan application started. But then when you're in that process, they work with a whole team. So they get a sense of how that works and then what that closing will look like. That's the day that you go and you sign all the paperwork and get the keys. But sort of that end of the loan application process and what, what to expect um, right before you close on a loan. And then I have Q&A, um, but I would say that we will stop sort of periodically throughout the presentation. So feel free to ask questions. Definitely put things in the chat. Uh, Denisha will sort of parse through those and ask questions as we go through the process. So definitely ask questions. And if something doesn't quite make sense, feel free to, to ask me to clarify. I get very accustomed to using all this lingo all the time. And I confess, um, before I ever got into this line of business, I took three uh, first-time homebuyer classes, and the element that most eluded me that I was a little confused about was the mortgage process. And at that time, if you said, told me I would be doing the job that I do now, I would have thought you were crazy. So um, no question is a stupid question. So pre-qualification versus pre-approval. A pre-qualification is largely verbal or it might be via email. And really it's that you're giving information about what your income is. You're verbally stating, I make $50,000 a year. They don't have any paper documents, no pay stubs or tax returns to sort of back anything up. Um, and it's a chance for you to get a sense, how much do I need for down payment? Um, and what do, what do you really need to know about that loan? Uh, but do know that if you do a pre-qualification, whether it's verbal or sometimes people will do stuff online. If you put in your social security number at any point or you give that social security number out, it is very likely, um, and I would say 99.99% sure, that your credit will get pulled whenever you provide that score. So if you're not ready for your credit to be pulled, just make sure you don't give out that yet. Um, and you can really use that pre-qualification process as an information gathering process. Then on the total other end of that is a pre-approval. This is a full legal pre-approval. And it's really a mortgage application where you're providing verifying documents. So you're providing tax returns and pay stubs and bank statements, W-2s, et cetera. And then you're working with a loan originator to put all of that application together. And an actual underwriter will review everything. They'll ask questions. They'll re dig really deep as though the same level of a loan application. So that's actually a full legal pre-approval. Now there are often letters or processes that are kind of in between these two extremes, that sort of verbal, you qualify for this amount based on what you've told me and that full doc underwritten review. And so some lenders will do a little more of a loose pre-qualification. They may have collected a few pay stubs, maybe some bank statements, but they might not have collected quite as much and they can give you that pre-approval pretty quickly. Um, and that's going to be signed by a loan originator. Then some lenders, and this is what Cambridge Trust does, does a full document review. The loan originator is the person that's going to do that full document review, and they will give you a letter. They'll call it a pre-approval, but it's not necessarily underwritten. So there's sort of varying degrees of that. 
And so when you're looking for a letter, you just sort of consider what do you need, what's going to make the most sense for you. Um, I do think personally, it's good to get a pre-approval or even a pre-qualification where you've given all of your documents and you have to have your you do have to have your credit pulled in order to get that letter to go make offers on homes or to submit applications for lotteries. So just something to consider. Are there any, and I'll stop here, are there any questions specific to these letters at this point? Yes. How long is a pre-approval valid for? That is a great question. Um, typically, they are going to be valid for 90 days. When you're shopping around, it's a good idea to ask but typically it's going to be 90 days. And then just know that it's very common for people to get pre-approvals because of the difficult market and how long it takes to find something that you may need to renew that pre-approval. You may have to submit updated pay stubs, updated bank statements, and your credit will get pulled again. So just sort of keep that in mind. Okay. Um, and then... Can you, you stated earlier that there's also where they can underwrite your pre-approval. Is that something mm -hmm. that you can request from a lender or not all of them do that? So if you wanted to just know um, what my final number was upfront. I would say you would wanna ask if that's what they do. If they don't, if that's not their process, you could request it. I anticipate that probably would not, um, that lender would say you might have to go somewhere else. I will say a fully underwritten pre-approval does take a lot longer. So just sort of keep that in mind because the underwriter is underwriting um, all the other loans that the bank is doing business with, all other home equity lines of credit, all other kinds of things. So that does put you in a queue that can take a significant amount of time. Um, but you can ask and find out, does my loan get fully underwritten by an underwriter? Okay. Um, Neela, I see your question, but it's not in this section. I'm going to wait till she's discussing the different loan products and credit. She's asking about what's the ideal credit score. Um, so okay. wait till we're in Talk that section. That. Yep, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, all right. So income, the four C's of lending. So first we look at capacity and capacity is really about your income. Do you have enough income to so support the loan amount you are uh, looking for? So we look at that piece. Then savings. Do you have enough savings to cover your down payment and all the closing costs? Some people think, okay, I've got it. I've got enough for the down payment. And they don't have any additional funds for the closing costs. That said, do keep in mind, we're looking at not only you can utilize your savings, what's in your personal account, you can also utilize gifts and uh, down payment assistance if available for the area where you're buying. Um, we look at credit. So it is not just about the score. The score is very important. There are thresholds by which you have to have a certain credit score or higher. Um, it varies by loan program, but we're also looking at how much debt you carry. So we're looking at your minimum monthly debt obligation. And then we are actually looking at what's happening in that credit report. So we are looking at all those pieces. And then lastly, the collateral property. So there needs to be an appraisal and that property does need to appraise. It needs to appraise at the value of what you're buying it for at least. And what we see in terms of appraisals is just know that typically it will appraise unless you've gotten into any sort of bidding war. And that's where you're offering $50,000 over or more. And that's where you might um, sort of get to the point where you, where you um, don't appraise at the amount that you're buying it at. And I don't tend to see that happen with um, most of our first time home buyers. So capacity, income. So acceptable income must be full or part-time employment, or I should say can be. It can be full and or part-time employment. You could be self-employed. So for uh, and that could be that you have full-time employment and you have self-employment. Um, I've seen many people where they will have a full-time job or a part-time job where they have W-2s, um, they get paychecks every week, but also they're doing something else as side work to make extra money. Very common. Um, very few people in this area are only doing one job. Um, uh, you know, it could be driving for rideshare or a variety of things that folks are doing. You might have seasonal employment, say there's something that you do every summer, every fall, whatever that may be. If it's consistent, really consistency is the key. 
Social Security and Retirement. I just did a loan for a borrower who receives only Social Security and retirement funds. Um, alimony and child support, we will utilize that. Please do keep in mind that there has to be backup documentation. And so with alimony and child support, we must see a divorce decree that indicates how much alimony and or child support is to be paid or a court order, a judgment that indicates how much child support needs to be paid. We have to see that legal documentation and then we have to see the regular receipt of those funds. So however it was detailed in that judgment, we then have to then see 12 months of bank statements, at least six months if you just started receiving it, we need at least six months, but typically it's 12 months of bank statements showing regular receipt of those funds. So just sort of keep that in mind. Oftentimes people receive, they've decided, or this is the option that is out there, is it's much more informal and it's not always consistent, which is unfortunate, um, but specifically when it comes to loan application process, because income can only be utilized um, when there's documentation and consistency. Um, there's also rental income. If you're buying a uh, multifamily, we can utilize the rental income from the units, either unit or unit, um, depending on the size of the property, depending on the number of units, and trust or dividend income as well. Any questions so far about the types of income? So I have one that I want to go back. You said for mm -hmm. child support or alimony, if it's mm -hmm. not, um, you, I guess the question is if it's not consistent, is it that it doesn't count? So let's say they've been paying consistently the, the spouse, the other spouse, mm -hmm. and now it's inconsistent, but they're still committed to paying it. Does that, hinder you from using that to to qualify because yes. i've seen that with a few buyers where they're like i get child support but i get it like you know this month maybe not for two months then he'll make up for it the third month so just trying to better understand that yeah if it is inconsistent it can't be used towards your loan amount it can only be used when it is consistent so if it is that you receive child support every two months and consistently every other month, that's when it's received, there's your consistency. But okay. if the judgment says every week or every month, this amount of payment, whatever the judgment says, that's how it needs to be received. Okay, understood. Um, and then questions in the chat. I like that you're, you're asking the questions after each slide. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so the person says, I work overtime periodically. Would that be counted towards income? So if you have been receiving overtime from the same job for at least two years, then yes, we would include the overtime as income to be utilized towards your loan amount. So if you, were, you just started working overtime, let's say it's six months, it does not count consistently. Not count so you have consistent. Amount. Okay. So it has to be two years. Yeah, additionally, if you were at one job and you received overtime, but then you move to a new job and you're receiving overtime, we can't put the 24 months of those two jobs together. It's 24 months of overtime at one job. Really? I did yeah. not know that part. Yeah. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I'm not sure if you have it later on in the, in the presentation or not. So people mm -hmm. who may be working where it's um, a base salary and then commission, how do you count that and when does it start to count? Because I know the commission doesn't start from day one, you know, to count yeah. towards a pre-approval. So, um, so it's a good question. So also commission is treated much like uh, overtime. It's a two year history, 24 month history. Just can, when in doubt, 24 months, when in doubt, two years. That's really looking at a history. Okay. It's consist. It's a history and consistency. Perfect. And then we have here, um, someone's asking if you can share a little bit more about, they just want to know about social security. Um, what are the so, guidelines for if someone's utilizing that mm -hmm. to qualify? So if you receive social, if you're retired and you're re already receiving social security benefits, um, you might have a child that you are caring for and they receive social security um, and they're going to be living with you for the long term, that income can be utilized. And really that documentation would be the letter that you receive from Social Security uh, indicating what the amount is that you receive. 
And then, then in fact, we utilize that amount and we actually gross that up. They use the term gross it up to account for the fact that you're not paying taxes on that. Where other folks where you're getting paid, you're already paying taxes. So that, that income will be grossed up. So you get a little bit more boost with that amount of money. Okay, perfect. And someone just asked, uh, what happens if you start a new job in the process? Because I've actually seen that happen where someone, mm -hmm. they left, and I know it's usually like you have to have a two-year work history um, or consistent mm -hmm. employment, and they switch jobs in the middle, but they were still able to proceed and move forward. Mm -hmm. But I know that's not always the case. So if it's during the pre-approval process, it's probably a little easier. And if when you change jobs, it's very similar to the last job, then it might be okay um, to do the pre-approval. However, if you do a job switch during a loan application, what you are going to need is 30 days of pay stubs. You're going to need all the documentation and back, backing up, and then you're going to have to go through underwriter, underwriting again. So it adds, it may end up being that during a loan application process, you might not be able to close by the date that you agreed to. So when you take your home buying class, one of the things you'll have an opportunity to do is hear from a, an attorney you're going to have hired an attorney to negotiate your purchase and sale. I'm not gonna go deep into that. However, in that document is where you agree to the dates and that includes the date by which you close. So if you get a new job during the process, it could have an impact on the date that you're able to close. The lender may not be able to get you to closing by the time that you need. So just sort of keep that in mind. But if you have an opportunity for a better job, a new job, just be sure that whatever loan originator or lender you're working with, to communicate them to find out what the impact will be. Because it's not our desire or goal to hold anybody back from an opportunity. Okay, that, that makes sense. And here someone asked, so they work part-time as a PCA and they're mm -hmm. looking, they're gonna work full-time as well, um, kind of within the same realm. Um, they said in the kitchen, is that acceptable? So what happens if you're part-time somewhere and now you're, you've you know, started a full-time job in a similar field versus um, a completely different field? So maybe you're a teacher and then you picked up a part-time and now you're a bartender mm -hmm. also, or, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you were part-time and you then, and you had that job part-time, and then you switch jobs and you had a, now you had a full-time job, it would be considered in the same field and you would just use that, in, you could use that income. You would have the two year work history. Um, I'm actually gonna uh, jump ahead to the next slide because we're gonna start talking about time period. Um, but if you were working full-time and then you went and got another part-time job and you would only have that part-time job for six months, the only income that would be utilized is that full-time. The additional part-time would not. So we'll talk a bit about um, sort of that income. Um, so it has to be stable and likely to continue. And that's why we have these guidelines and really Fannie Mae guidelines that the lender is required to follow. Um, so it has to be stable and likely to continue. And that's why there's that two year work history requirement. Um, for those of you who have a W-2, um, you're salaried and you might even work hourly, but you get a pay stub every week and we can see from that pay stub how you get paid. And then at the end of the year, you get a W-2. We're looking at your gross monthly income. And so that's before taxes are taken out, before anything is deducted. We do everything based on gross. Um, and we're looking, you have to have a two, minimum of two years employment history. And so that could be in the same job or it might be that you've had uh, different jobs, but it's the same type of work. And it's kind of clear from the application that we can see that you've kind of been doing the same kind of work. It doesn't have to be the exact same job, but it has to make sense that the work you did in one job, those skills kind of apply to what you're doing now. Um, or if you have been in school, we can utilize school as part of your work history. If what you were studying directly correlates to the work that you're now doing. So I've had some people where they've been working um, for six months at their job. They were, they were in school previously, they graduated, and now they finally got a job um, sort of starting out their career. Um, gaps. Uh, oftentimes, people have gaps in employment. So you take those two years, but they weren't working for X number of dates. Uh, so very common in 2020, a lot of people had gaps in employment where they were not working. They were either furloughed 
um, or laid off. And um, so if they were furloughed and then they went back, all we need to do, all we need to hear is that you, um, you were furloughed due to COVID or you were laid off from one job and then you were able to get another job. And as long as it was in the same kind of work, then that would be no problem. There's certainly folks who were laid off from one type of work and then they ended up switching the type of work that they do. And for those, if you do switch into a different type of industry, if it doesn't correlate, then you would have to wait those two years until you have that two year work history. Um, and then, um, so just gaps need explaining, um, you know, sometimes I've uh, done loans and somebody was on maternity leave and that's why they were gone or they had some sort of, um, you know, injury, on the job injury or something. And you don't have to go into too much detail, just explaining what happened, that makes sense. Um, and then self-employment is a bit different. Self-employment is where we use the net income and it's an average of 24 months. So we're looking at two years worth of income. So for example, uh, many people will do ride share. Uh, so they'll drive for Lyft and or for Uber. And we're looking at how much income. So we'll take the income that we see on the schedule C in the taxes. And then wherever you are in the year, we'll have a profit and loss statement. So however much income you brought in, however much your expenses were, minus your expenses from that income for the, from January 1st to let's just say today, uh, March 23rd. And that net, net income we'll use. And we'll do an average of 24 months. Um, but do keep in mind, Many people with self-employment, especially, well, whether it's your main uh, source of income or uh, an additional supplemental income, will often do a lot of deductions on their taxes to lessen their tax liability, which everyone completely understands why you would make those choices. The sort of unintended consequence of that is if you are looking to get qualified for a loan, you would only be able to use that net income. And very often folks will get that net income to a very low amount. So you may wanna sort of take a look at your tax returns and say, okay, how much was my net income previously? If it changes drastically, it doesn't mean that you can't, still can't move forward, but you will get questions from the underwriter. Why all of a sudden do you no longer have any of those expenses? So just kind of keep that in mind. That is a real key element here. All right, any questions about this piece? Oh, I think you answered everything there perfectly. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So savings. So a key thing with your savings is it has to be verifiable. We have to see where that money came from. And in fact, I was just having a conversation with a borrower who was looking to get pre-approved. She wants to submit an application for a lottery property and she has money saved, but she also has cash that she has at home. And she wants to be able to use all of it towards her down payment. And so the unfortunate piece is that she can only use the money that she has in her bank account. The cash at home cannot be used. And in fact, even if you were to put it into your bank account, cash you might have at home, we still wouldn't be able to use it. We would eliminate it. We would say, okay, we see that there's money, but we can't trace it. And it's really um, federal money laundering laws that keep us from being able to use that funds. Everything has to be verified and traceable. Um, so if you do have cash um, or you're engaged in, you know, a lot, I've talked with folks too, they might be doing a SUSU and that's a way to save. If that SUSU is not really, really detailed and um, in terms of documented of how it's being managed, um, then that might be challenging through the underwriting process. And you may want to get that money from the SUSU into your bank account and the terms that they use is that season the money. Basically seasoning the money means it's in there long enough that the bank or the underwriter doesn't see it being deposited. There's always gonna be a two, at least two months of bank statements. And as long as we don't see where it was deposited, um, then we won't worry about it. Um, but if we see large, large deposits, there's always gonna be questions and they're gonna ask to source it, where did it come from? So just sort of keep that in mind. So uh, uh, savings that we would use, it could be from your savings account, checking account, 
Uh, people will have saved money more long-term in CDs because you can get slightly higher interest rates. You could get gifts from family members. Do keep in mind, you're going to need to document where that money came from as well. So if you have a family, me family member that has cash, you're like, no problem, just put it in the bank account and then send it over. That could be problematic in terms of documenting. So just sort of keep that in mind as well. Sale of stocks, um, bonds. Uh, folks will definitely do investment instead of just the straight savings. Sometimes they'll do stocks and bonds. Uh, 401k, you can utilize funds from your 401k or 403b. Do keep in mind if you do opt to use some of those funds, um, you will have to provide the terms. And you can just go to your a HR or go to the company where that is like Fidelity um, or Principal or wherever at Vanguard and say, I need to know the terms of my specific account because uh, everyone's a little bit different and you're going to want to know exactly how much of that of those funds you can use. It will vary depending on what your program is. Um, and then there's financial assistance. So I've listed a variety here. I know all of you are interested in Sage um, Fountain and this is Boston specific. So there's going to be uh, the city of Boston has significant financial assistance available. Um, so we'll talk about some of that. There's straight financial assistance that is not associated with a specific loan prog program is up to $30,000 for a condo. Um, so it's really a good chunk of money that can be really helpful in your process. Additionally, I would say from this list, the last one I have listed is Federal Home Loan Bank Equity Builder. This is additional money. There's also a how fund, but if you just sort of keep in mind Federal Home Loan Bank, um, there can be additional funds available to help you with that. And that is bank specific. So for example, Cambridge Trust has applied to the Federal Home Loan Bank to have this pot of money available for first time home buyers. So you can talk with that lender to see if this might be a resource for you. Um, do keep in mind that this money is not guaranteed. Uh, throughout the year, the Federal Home Loan Bank kind of releases little pots of money and there's competition for it. So we can only apply for it um, once you have a purchase and sale. So just sort of keep that in mind if you get picked for the lottery or if you get a home under contract to see if that might be an extra source of funds. So um, that's an additional resource available. And that does become, that is a grant if you live there and own the home for at least five years. Whereas funding from the city of Boston is a 0% uh, loan that's payable once you sell or refinance the property. So something that's kind of just keep in mind about those funds. So I will stop here. Any questions? I'm going to go back and um, ask some of these before I ask mine. And before so someone I already answered. Mm -hmm. I have two things that just popped into my head that I want to make sure I don't lose. Um, I'm seeing more and more people who are investing in crypto. And I would say, if you are looking to buy a home, wait to invest in crypto until after you buy a home. Having those funds and getting those funds out of crypto, the documentation is often very poor and underwriting. This is a new source of funds to banks, and it is not something that's easily used towards um, your home purchase. And it's really, the statements that they provide are difficult to really fully understand. Um, and so it's not a good source. So I would just say generally, I'm not telling you don't invest in crypto, you make your own financial decisions, but when it comes to home ownership, this is something that's not useful when it comes to having funds and investing for home ownership. Um, so uh, can I, yeah. okay, I'll let you go with the, finish that and I'll write down the crypto mm -hmm. question so you don't forget your second thought. Was yeah. that it? And that's, the other thing was um, I, I often see, we'll see sometimes I'll see people with many different accounts and moving money. And it sort of becomes this a, a strategy of how you've started, how uh, you've decided to sort of manage having money for the different things that you do have money for in life. Um, the more you're moving money from accounts here to accounts there, the more challenging it makes to sort of see where your money is coming and going, the many more questions you're going to you're going to get and the more challenging it is. So I would uh, just sort of encourage you, what I sort of tell people is, you know, as you're preparing for home ownership, um, sort of live your most boring financial life possible. Have everything be um, really, really stable. Everything into one account, leave it all there. The more you move money 
Um, and then especially during the application processes, the more you're gonna have to provide more documentations and explanations. All right, so I will now question time. Um, so with the crypto, I I think I'm making a clar clarifying statement, but you can correct me if I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you can invest in crypto if that is what you're part of your wealth building journey and goals. You just can't use the proceeds or the profit from crypto mm -hmm. um, as down payment for a house. So yeah. it doesn't affect the home buying journey as long as you're not trying to use those funds as for the down payment. Yes. Okay. With the caveat, and I'm not going to be able to give an exact definite, with many, with some of the loan programs, there is a liquid asset limit. And so if your liquid asset, that liquid asset limit is 75,000. If you are close to that, and then there's also lots in crypto funds, that can be a challenge. So I don't give financial advice in terms of how you want to invest. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm saying it becomes, it's a more complicated thing for underwriters because it's a new way of investing. And so it makes it more difficult. So I would say in terms of preparing and planning for home ownership, um, I would have your money in more traditional forms. Okay. Um, and for the, and I know you'll talk about it later in terms of documentation, mm -hmm. is it that they're providing documentation for all of their bank accounts or just the primary bank accounts? And like, all bank accounts, all. every single bank account at all, all investment accounts, all accounts. And, you know, we can sort of see all of those, all of the activity in other bank accounts. So for example, I was just working with somebody and he has, he's investing in crypto in three different um, ways. One has statements. They're sort of unclear um, as to how much that asset really is. And then um, he's investing in crypto and there's not even any statements, but you see it coming out of the bank account. So the question is, where's that asset? So how does that factor in? This is a new element for banks to deal with and it, it kind of muddies the water. Understood, understood. Um, someone asked, I answered in the, in the chat, um, what mm -hmm. if they had the money in their checking account and they took it out and they save it at home? Can they use it? I'm like, well, don't do that. <laughs> Cause mm -hmm. it, yeah. If, as soon as it becomes cash, it is useless to your home ownership efforts. If it's in an account, it is good. If it comes out of it and it's just cash at home, you can no longer use it. So leave it in there. Um, and the mm -hmm. follow up question to that that someone had, they only have a checking account. Um, if they don't have a savings account, does that disqualify them? No, I work with lots of people and they have all of their money in one account. Yep, yep. you can have one account and that's totally fine. So I, I put in my little financial education hat in there and I put in the chat, it's fine to have it in one account, but just for money management, if you have savings, you should have a savings account. So you're not accidentally mm -hmm. spending money that you shouldn't. Um, so just for more yeah. money management, strategies than mm -hmm. something that you can or cannot do. Yep. Um, someone asked what's the ballpark you should have in savings. Um, and I let them know, I didn't send it actually, it's still in my, my chat, but the how much you should save is really dependent on the purchase price because your down payment is a percentage of the purchase price. So we can't say save $10,000 um, because we don't know how much you know you'd be qualified for. Um, but when you're saving, I usually say start at 10 and keep aiming for increments of 5,000. Keep going until you speak with a loan officer to know your numbers, but kind of give yourself a goal, start at 10,000, just keep going, keep saving. You'll never hurt yourself saving more. <laughs> but I'll, I'll do, I do a little example. We have a slide that we'll get to that I do a little example, just to kind of, so you have a visual. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this one? I'm reading through. Okay. For 401k, do you need to have a signed purchase and sales before you reach out to them for the down to pull to withdraw funds? 
You would have to check with that company. I don't think so, but you would want to check with your company uh, what they require to do the withdrawal of the funds. Okay. And then what happens if you are a co-signer or if you have a shared account? That's actually a good one. Um, if you have a joint account with someone. So how is that traced or verified? Um, if you are borrowing, if you have a it's okay to have a joint account. They might ask why you have a joint account. Sometimes people have joint accounts with their parents because they're, you know, sort of kind of helping manage their money or with their kids and helping them manage their money. Um, so it's okay. Uh, but if it's not being used, you just have to say, this is, I'm not going to be using this towards the purchase, um, but, but it's fine. Just know that you'll get asked questions. As long as your name is on that account, then you're fine. Okay. And then if you invest in mutual funds or trading, do you have to put it on the application if you're not going to use the money from the investment? Yes, because those are considered liquid assets. And so for some loan pro programs, um, you know, we're looking to make sure you're not over because we're good like, okay, if we, if we try to put you in the most affordable product, but if you don't qualify, then we have to sort of figure out what's the next best thing. Um, but also it's good to show that you have other savings other than what you're using towards the, towards the home purchase. It shows reserves and that's not a bad thing, but you do have to provide documentation of all assets. Perfect, thank you. That's it for questions. You're welcome. All right, so how much money do you need? So first you have to say, uh, how much do you need? You need enough to cover the down payment. So typically for first time home buyer programs, you need to have at least 3% of the purchase price as the down payment because it is a requirement. Um, then you're also going to have to be able to have enough money to cover those closing costs. And so just to get an idea of some of the things that are in closing costs, there's very often uh, an origination fee, there will be title insurance. When you take your home buying class, you're going to learn more about title insurance from the attorney um, because that's who, who kind of manages that. So there's a title insurance policy for the lender that you will pay for, but then you may consider a policy for yourself as well. Many people will do that to protect their asset. Um, there's going to be attorney fees. There'll be fees. You'll hire an attorney to represent yourself, but you'll also pay for the attorney that does all the bank work, uh, make sure that there's a free and clear title. Nobody else can come take ownership of that property. Um, there's going to be recording fees. Uh, all of the mortgages have to get recorded. There's often uh, multiple mortgages. Um, there's a condo questionnaire for condos. Sometimes the condo associations will require a fee for that. Um, municipal lien fee, we wanna make sure there's no liens on that property. You're not gonna assume some other debt from some other judgment or something like that. Flood certification, are you in a flood zone? Will there be a need for flood um, insurance and then credit report fee. There's prepaid expenses. So additionally, you're gonna have prepaid interest. And so this kind of gets, you know, kind of wrapping your head around this piece, people get stuck a lot of times. I know I did at first, um, but your mortgage is, a, is paid in what they call arrears. So on April 1st, when folks who will go to pay their mortgage, when they pay it on April 1st, when it's due, it actually covers the month of March. We're very accustomed that when we're, you know, we're starting out, we're paying rent. When we pay on April 1st, we're paying for the month of April. But when you pay your mortgage, you're paying for the, for the month before. So if you close on any day other than the first, you're gonna have some prepaid interest that you're gonna need to cover. Um, you're also gonna have money that goes into escrow. You, they uh, require, usually it's about a three month cushion where there's three months worth of money that goes in that goes towards your property taxes and your home insurance. If um, you have a single family or multifamily or you have a condo where they're required to have uh, a condo insurance policy in addition to that master insurance. So it might be that that gets paid. The bank will pay those on your behalf. So whenever your taxes come due, the bank actually works with the city, knows what your taxes are, and pays your taxes for them as they come due. When, you, um, when, and when you've been in your home for a year, your home policy, your home insurance policy is going to come due, the bank will pay that and renew that for you. 
So those are going to go into an escrow, escrow account. Then, um, and then also sometimes you're going to need to have reserves. So I specifically indicate a multifamily here, but sometimes folks might need um, some compensating factors to get to the loan amount that they desire. And so you might need to have some reserves there. So that means money is still in your bank account when you close. So just sort of keep thinking about the items that you need. And then I did also mention too, um, this is specifically for the bank, but do keep in mind that when you do buy a home, you may need to buy a uh, home insurance policy up front. So we're talking specifically about Sage on Fountain, so that would be a condo. And I don't actually know if there's gonna be a required um, home insurance for each unit, but if there is, you may have to buy a home insurance policy up front. So you're, and that would be a condo policy. They call it an HO6 policy. That's another piece when you take your home buying class, there'll probably be a home insurance representative at that class. And they'll talk a lot about that, but you might, you're gonna need a bit for that and for home inspection. So just sort of keeping those things in mind. Okay, so an example, if we were to look at a condo that costs 300,000, we're gonna make an estimate that the taxes are $4,000 annually. Do keep in mind, that every city and town has a different tax rate, so that varies. So you may be looking to get pre-approved because you're interested in one of the Sage on Fountain properties, but you may look at other properties in other areas. And so that is gonna vary. So for example, um, the residential tax rate for Boston is $10.88. I've seen it in other communities go as high as 21%. Um, and as low as, I want to say Cambridge is like five, $5.92. So it really does vary drastically. So that does change depending on which community you're planning to purchase in. We generally do an estimate of a condo fee of about $250. Um, oftentimes it's lower with new properties, with lottery properties. Um, and so we sort of factor those pieces in. We know on a $300,000 condo, 3% down is $9,000. Um, very often you may need to have one and a half percent of that from your own funds. And then you can have the other half of that required down payment come from a gift um, and or financial assistance. So say you're, you're, you get picked, you're ready, you're gonna buy a unit at Sage on Fountain and you have enough or you have half of that. So it's, um, $4,500 you have saved. And then you can get another $4,500 in financial assistance to get that 3% down payment. And then you may actually be able to get enough financial assistance to cover those closing costs. So just to give you an idea, that would be a $300,000 property. If it's lower, then it's gonna be lower. Closing costs, just a general estimate, about $4,500 prepaids. That would be that prepaid interest. And, and um, the money that goes into escrow around 2,500. So you'd really need about $16,000 to buy a $300,000 property. And that's an estimate. Could be a little more, could be a little less. So just to give you a sense, the lower the purchase price, the lower that amount you're gonna need, the higher the purchase price, the more you're gonna need. So um, should, and any questions up to this point before we dig into credit? Yes. Um, if you don't have down payment or closing costs, will the lender or the seller allow the buyer to put that down payment money on the back end of the loan? Uh, no. You are will be required. You have to have enough funds in order to close to pay that required down payment and um, and the closing costs. And it cannot be rolled into the loan. And can closing cost, or what is the max closing cost? Because sometimes sellers can pay closing cost. Is there a cap in terms of how much they can put towards that? Oh. Uh, can they pay 100% of your closing cost? I think it's like up to 6%. I actually don't remember what that exact amount is. I, I do apologize. I feel like it's like no, up to it 6%. Is, it is the, I think I do remember it being around the 6%. So that means mm -hmm. if, if your closing costs usually is around, let's say around 2%, then they could potentially cover all of it. And like, when is it, honest mm -hmm. question, when is it ever but 6% would, that you'd have closing yeah. costs that high? 
Yeah. And I would say that when you're structuring that offer, just to make sure that it doesn't just go towards closing costs, that, that, that it gets as much uh, flexibility as possible, uh, closing costs, prepaids and interest. And can the seller give you money towards your down payment? Is that allowed? No, because that would be a gift at that point, And that's not a family member. They would, yeah, no. I had that and I didn't ask. Are we going to talk about that later? What qualifies as gifts? Um, like where can you get a gift? I from? mentioned like, it you know? before. A gift is to, has to come from a family member. How do you verify that? Um, there's a variety of ways, but most likely we're going to require either bank statements or deposit statements or it's going to, it's going to be verified. Yeah. Okay. So are we ready for credit? Okay. So credit score. Um, so Cambridge Trust looks for a 660 or a 680. Uh, it varies on loan program. Um, so some loans will go lower, um, but you're going to want to know what that threshold is. And in fact, if you think you are at a 660, um, you may want to do a, a little bit of work to get it higher because it is very common to need for it to take longer than you think. And if you need to get a pre-approval um, updated, your credit's going to get pulled again. So just something to keep in mind. Um, the, we pull, all lenders are going to pull from all three bureaus. So there's TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. We are going to use the middle score and for the loan application. If there's two borrowers, we will pull from all three bureaus for both borrowers. And then we will look at the two middle scores for each borrower. And then we will utilize the lower one. So if you have two borrowers together and somebody has, you know, 700 credit and you have the other one has uh, 620, we're going to use 620 for those both borrowers and that loan, it would be denied because the credit score utilized for the loan application process would be too low. Um, for credit, you may have a credit score. I've, I've worked with folks where they're like, yeah, my credit's great. I'm like, oh, excellent, great score. And then they only have one trade line. So a trade line is essentially if you have a credit card and that uh, lender who lends you wherever that credit card is from, they're going to report every month. And on your credit report, we're going to see all that information about that particular credit card, how much you borrow, what you pay back. We're going to see all the history there. That's a trade line on your credit report. So we need to see at least three trade lines. And essentially what that means is you're borrowing from three different places. It could be three credit cards. It could be two credit cards and a car loan. Um, it could be a variety of things. It could be student loans. Had um, oftentimes student loans, you get a new student loan um, every semester. So if you have multiple student loans, then we could just use that. Um, but you do have to have three trade lines. If you do not, then we can utilize non-traditional credit. And then that's on the next slide and I'm gonna go over what that is. Um, and then we generally uh, suggest keeping your revolving debt to below 30% usage. Um, one useful element of this is that it, your score will go higher when it's below that threshold. Um, I've also, this is one of the things that I see, I don't know why it is, but if you keep a little bit of a balance versus paying things off, that will also boost your score as well. It's not right. It, I understand why you would want to pay it off. That makes sense because you don't, because you're going to have to pay to have that balance. You have an interest rate that you have to pay. But if you do need to boost that score, that can help it a little bit. But also, we rec recommend below 30% usage because the more debt you carry, the more that impacts your loan amount um, and how much money you can borrow. It also impacts. Uh, makes it harder once you do have that mortgage. The more other debt you're carrying, the harder that becomes. Um, fraud alerts. Many people have fraud alerts on their um, on their reports. I have one. You know, identities are being stolen all the time. People trying to use your credit cards, trying to steal. Um, so we understand that. Just for the purposes of pulling your credit, we need those fraud alerts lifted because we have to be able to receive that information um, and just explained. 
and it's common, they say, oh, well, my identity theft. Okay, perfect, great. And just know that through this process, there will be a lot of questions. That's just par for the course and they just need explanations. Sometimes people feel um, like it's invasive and it's an invasive and kind of a, you know, not an awesome process to go through, but just know that it's not personal um, and that you don't need to worry um, about that process. Just sort of provide the explanations, no problem. Um, and then on your credit report, we're gonna see addresses and inquiries and late payments, all that stuff. It just needs to be explained. Um, they might say, why, please explain this address. Um, you just, and sometimes you might have addresses on there that aren't yours, say you don't know. Um, inquiries, it's just like, oh, I was shopping. I got a pre-approval from another lender and then I came over here. That's no problem. Or did you get a new credit card? It had a great 0% interest rate or you got great points. Just let them know what you did. Um, and then one key thing to keep in mind, if there is anything on your credit report, anything is in collections, even if you're disputing it, if it's still being reported as in collections and there's money owed, we can, a lender cannot move forward. You have to either get that paid or get it removed first. So I do recommend getting a copy of your all three reports and making sure whether or not um, there's anything on there because I have worked with folks and they were surprised. They said, I, dis I disputed it, it should be gone and it's not. So it means you have to still work with the bureaus to get that resolved. Um, or pay it. Um, so just sort of keep that in mind. As long as there's anything in collections, you cannot proceed, even with a pre-approval. Any questions so far about credit? I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, because actually it's, okay. a, it's a situation that happened today. Um, so right. someone said, you know, they have collections and it's supposed to fall off in next month, April. So what happens if it's past that statute of limitations, which is like about seven years, I think, for Massachusetts, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. still on there? Is it still a no-go? You have to figure that out beforehand? Yeah, I would say figure it out and make sure that you've seen the credit and you've seen that it's not there and that it's gone. As long as it's there, even if it's past the statute of limitations, um, and my understanding, I could, I might not be correct in this. It is my understanding that you might get exactly to that seven year date. Plus, I think there's, I can almost be like, it doesn't really come off for another 180, potentially up to another 180 days, which is significant, but that you can go to the bureaus and um, I don't know if it's a dispute, but basically say this must be removed and then they will remove it. But it may stay on there longer than seven years because there's like a, there's another additional window. So, OK, and I will share with you. Go ahead. Yep, go ahead. No, I will share, guys. We have our 90 day challenge going on as, uh, in partnership with um, the Sage on Fountain Project. So if you need help with. I'm kind of figuring out your budget, figuring out your credit, disputing those things. We do have a credit specialist who walks you guys through that process for free. So it's not a cost. Um, they teach you what you need to do so you can handle that on your own. If you want someone else to do it, then you'd have to pay. Um, but if you want um, kind of the letters and the instructions and the guidance on how to remove things yourself, we have that um, in the 90 day challenge as well. So I'll share that information with you guys. All right. So then we get to non-traditional credit. Let's just say you don't use credit, you have in the past, you've stopped and you're like, not for me, or you've never had credit, it's common. I've definitely seen folks where there's like, I don't wanna use it, it's too much, too much. Um, or you might have one credit card or two, you don't have enough trade lines. Um, then you would have to utilize non-traditional credit. So first you would wanna make sure that the lender you're working with does allow for non-traditional credit. And then you would need to find is do they only use it as a supplement if you don't have enough trade lines or do they also use it if you have zero credit, um, no history whatsoever? So at Cambridge Trust, we do both. Um, we use it to supplement or we use it as um, an alternative to no credit. Um, one of the key things that's really important for this is you must be able to document 12 months of rent paid on time. Um, if you cannot document that, then you cannot utilize the non-traditional credit option. And you may need to consider either waiting 
Um, you would need to apply for credit. You would need to establish credit and have three trade lines, and then you would be able to move forward or have 12 months of rent paid on time. And the only way we can utilize, the only documentation we can use is in the form of canceled rent checks. So if you're paying your rent on time, the exact amount, um, the same every month, um, or through bank statements. Lots of people are paying through Venmo or specific rent apps. Um, sometimes also people say, oh, but I, I was paying cash. I just go get it out. I have a quirky landlord. That's how they want it. Um, as long as we can see that every month on the same, pretty much at the same time, whether it's, you know, you go on the 28th or the 29th and you take out $2,000 or $500 or whatever your amount is that you pay, um, as long as we can see that exact amount of rent, um, then we can utilize that. But we would need 12 full months of bank statements. So do keep in mind that if you are utilizing non-traditional credit, but you've also tried to season some money, you might have a conflict here because though that, you know, you're not really supposed to use more than two months for that application. You now have an underwriter that is going through 12 months of bank statements. And if there's anything of concern, it is going to be asked about and can impact your um, application. Do keep that in mind. Did not think um, about that. Thank you for yeah. saying that. You might have two bank accounts. You have one where you pay the rent. You have another one where you season money. I know this is being recorded. Please don't send this to my boss. So, but just kind of keep those things in mind as you're strategizing how you're going to get ready. Um, then you would also need a utility bill in your name at the address where you live. So examples, NSTAR, Eversource, Comcast, RCN, those types of things. Um, and then you need a third source. It could be another utility bill or a phone bill. Or you might have car insurance where you have a monthly obligation and I pay my car insurance, it comes directly out of my bank account, I could show and document that, a gym membership, childcare. So something where you have a monthly debt obligation that you pay on time as agreed every month. And the key of this is everything has to be on time as agreed. So for example, if your utility bill, if you missed a month um, and you caught up the next month, which I've done, I'm like, oh shoot, I missed that. Um, it's not going to work. So it's, it's, um, they're going to say you missed that month, you didn't pay on time as agreed. So it ends up being 12 months of actual statements that you download from the website and provide those full statements where they can see this was the bill, this was they paid last month, they paid the previous month, they can kind of see that history. So keep that in mind. So that's non traditional credit if you uh, do need it. Any questions? Yes, someone just asked a great question. I, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to um, have you answer it. What sure. happens if you are staying with family so nothing is in your name? So, if you were, and this is common. This is also common. If you are staying with family and nothing is in your name, non traditional credit is not an option for you. And if you don't have credit or you don't have enough trade lines, you will have to wait until you establish credit with enough trade lines. You Thank may you. also consider paying rent. There may be questions. If you're living with your parents, you're living with your friends, you're living with siblings, with family members, whatever that may be. But I would say get a checkbook if you don't have one. A lot of people don't have them anymore. Get a checkbook and write a check to them every month for you know a reasonable amount. And um, you know they may hold that money in their account until they're done. They may gift them. If you do that though, and then they gift money, you're gonna have a problem. I just buy so like, that's example, a strategy. You just can't, yeah. you cancel so it. So for example, if you're paying rent, let's just say you live with a parent, you're paying the parent rent, and then you turn around and then you need, you're getting a gift from that exact same parent, that may prove problematic because they're gonna say you're paying rent to the parent, that, that could be problematic. If they were to gift you that money after you close or give that back to you, nobody knows the difference. Again, we're being recorded. Don't share with my boss. All right. 
So you, but you just cancel that out. Because I was saying that's a genius idea for someone in terms of strategy. I'm like, definitely. It's a strategy for moving costs. It's a strategy for furniture. There will be costs later, but it's not a strategy. It may not be a strategy for um, your down payment, but something, I mean, think about exactly where that goes. I don't know. Nope, I, I understand. I understand. Um, and then someone asked here, what if you have rent receipts, can they be used? Um, I think the answer is as long as the rent receipt matches the the money coming out of your account. No? So if we have 12 months bank statements, a rent receipt is really nobody's, it's just extra stuff. No, we can't use rent receipts. No rent receipts and no like, um, like a rent roll, no from the prop management company or property manager that sort of, so yeah, it's. Canceled bank rent checks, bank statements. So they need That's to see it. if, you're, yeah, it, it, they just need to see the money coming out of your account consistently, the same yep. amount, because that's your rent yep. receipt, essentially. Yep. Yes. Okay. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right. So next. Okay. So collateral, the last piece, property you're buying, there's going to be an appraisal. This will determine the value. Um, so when you do your loan application, one of the first things in the loan application, once you say, yes, I'm moving forward, is you're going to pay for an appraisal upfront. This is the one upfront cost for the bank that you're going to have to pay. Um, and it will, be, it will be indicated on your closing disclosure, showing that that piece has already been paid. Um, there's going to be the title is going to be reviewed. So the attorney that represents the bank is going to make sure that the title is free and clear. Nobody else can come in and, and claim it. Um, nobody has any sort of rights to the property in any sort of way that um, that's gonna be a problem for you. Uh, municipal lien certificate, we wanna make sure all taxes, assessments, water and sewer charges have been paid by the seller. You will not incur any of those costs that came before you. And then 6D certificate, if it is an already established property, this won't be the case for a new property like Sage on Fountain, but if you were buying a property on the regular market, somebody was selling, um, that's them signing off and basically saying, yes, I've paid all my, um, all my condo fees. You don't wanna buy a property and then say, oh, and now I owe three months back condo fees because they just didn't pay. You're, you are gonna wanna have to uh, make sure that that's all paid. And nobody's gonna close. The bank won't close until this is all completed. All right, so now we're gonna talk about loan programs um, for first time home buyers. And I always start with MHP's One Mortgage. So MHP is Massachusetts Housing Partnership. One Mortgage is a specific loan for first time home buyers just in the state of Massachusetts. Um, we are not lucky because the housing costs here are so high, but we are very lucky to have loan programs and resources that are just do not exist in most other places. So the one great thing about one mortgage is it's a below market interest rate. So all uh, it's only offered by certain participating banks and all banks who participate in it have to offer a below market interest rate. Um, oftentimes it'll be similar, but you should shop around to find out who is the best rate because that's going to be the best uh, savings for you. Um, so for example, rates have been crazy lately, um, just jumping up. Um, and we've seen them in the high fours. I saw them in the low fives for a bit. Um, and so a lot of folks, one mortgage interest rates are going up. So they're going to be in the low threes or the high twos. Um, at Cambridge Trust right now, it's 2.5%. It could go up. I anticipate it might go up a bit, but it will always stay low. So it's not only going to stay the required discount amount, but even below um, other lenders. So just kind of keep that in mind. There's never any private mortgage insurance. So I haven't mentioned this up to this point. With most loan programs, um, if you do less than 20% down, you will be required to pay private mortgage insurance, often just referred to as PMI, sometimes MI. Um, so you pay PMI until you have paid down the loan enough, or maybe the market value has gone up until you have at least 20% equity. So that's a cost that you won't have to worry about. There's a 3% down payment. One and a half percent of that down payment has to be from your own funds coming out of your own account. 
Um, and then the rest you could get as a gift or financial assistance. The loan is fixed for 30 years and there's income eligibility based on household size. So we say up to 100% area median income. So what the heck is that? Nobody knows what that means. It's like, doesn't even make any sense. So it's basically the median income of all incomes in the area. These are set by HUD every year. Right now, the numbers that we work with from HUD for a single uh, person household, as long as you make $88,450 or less annually, you qualify for one mortgage. That goes up incrementally for every additional household member. So for example, two people, 101,000, um, three people, 113,000, four people, 126,000. I've rounded those up or down, um, but that's about the, the gist of it. Um, you can get that information down at the bottom. You'll see it says www.mhp.net. So you can get those income guidelines. Um, it does vary by county and community. So if you are looking outside the city, you end up saying, okay, I'm not gonna do the Sage on Fountain thing, or you end up going somewhere else, just make sure that you qualify for um, whatever that limit is in that area. Um, there's a liquid asset cap, so I kind of mentioned this earlier, so you can have no more than $75,000 in liquid assets. So this would be how much you have in your checking and savings, how much if you have any money that's a CD, anything in a Roth IRA is considered liquid uh, because you've already covered the taxes or the consequences to use it are not so great. Um, if you have any money in stocks, bonds, and then there's crypto, which is that sort of like gray area, weird investment piece of figuring that out. And that can factor in. Um, if your household income is below 80% area median income, then there's also additional subsidy available. And actually I, that gets utilized with a lot of uh, folks that I pre-approve. Um, and it really can have a, a pretty significant impact on getting your loan amount a bit higher, which is great. So for example, uh, for a household of four, um, you know, I mentioned that 100% area median income was a little over 126,000. If you make under 101,000, then you would be eligible for that uh, subsidy as well. And that subsidy goes towards helping to pay for that interest for seven years. So that can be a benefit as well. And again, it's only available through participating banks. You can get more Im information at mhp.net and they also have a very good um, calculator where you can plug all your information in to get an idea. It's not gonna be exact, but to get an idea of how much loan you qualify for. So that can give you a good sense. Uh, before you even talk to a lender, you can go look at that calculator. So this is where I start with one mortgage. This is really, I think, sort of the best overall program um, sort of statewide. For those of you who are Boston residents and buying in Boston. So you're a Boston resident now, you enter the lottery, you get picked, you're gonna buy a property at Sage on Fountain, you have the opportunity to utilize one plus Boston. Essentially what that is, is one mortgage, which I've just talked about, with additional enhancements. The key additional enhancements are, is there gonna be an interest rate buy down? So there's the interest rate will be either a point, a full point or half a point lower, depending on your income. Um, and then some additional financial assistance. So it's $50,000 total. Some of that money gets used towards buying down that rate. Um, and then whatever's left over, can be utilized um, towards the purchase price. And the city of Boston determines how much you're eligible for. And they basically say it's based on need. So with the prices, many folks uh, with Say John Fountain, it's probably going, it, actually it's gonna vary. It really depends on how much you need in order to get into that property. And so you're gonna work with one of those participating lenders um, and below I have, the participating lenders who do One Plus Boston are SVB, that's Silicon Valley Bank, also was known as Boston Private, Cambridge Trust, Citizens, the City of Boston Credit Union, Rockland Trust, and the Cooperative Bank. So these are the key banks that offer this loan program. Um, it's gonna be the same guidelines as one mortgage, and it really does increase um, your borrowing power. And for some, it will mean the ability to, to afford the property. It will be um, maybe without it, you might not be able to afford the property. 
So a key piece of this though, is that the city of Boston has an application that's sort of in the middle of the process. So when you get a pre-approval, you're gonna start with a lender and the lender is gonna have you uh, submit an application. Uh, for most of us, I, I would say for all of us, it's probably all online. Then you would submit um, supporting documents. Those are your three years of tax returns, 30 days pay stubs. Um, it might be a profit and loss statement if you have self-employment income, uh, bank statements, et cetera. Once you've submitted all of those, they will put the estimates together and then they will submit everything to the city. And um, what I do is I try, uh, I work to maximize as much of that um, financial assistance as possible in how I put that scenario together for you. And then we submit it to the city. The city will then reach out to you and you'll have an application that you'll do with them. That can take some time. Um, they only have so many staff and depending on vol volume, that kind of holds them up. They say it's a 10 to 14 day turnaround from when they have a full application. I would say from my experience, it can take significantly longer. So just sort of keep that in mind. That's a key element. Um, and I would encourage all of you, if you're interested in Sage on Fountain, to get pre-approved for One Plus Boston prior to um, submitting for your lottery application. Um, but you don't have to have the One Plus Boston pre-approval in order to submit a loan application, but it will help uh, to have done that work up front. So just so that would be anyone buying in Boston, I would recommend this one uh, first and foremost. Um, if those two options, depending on what you're doing, are not there, um, I would then recommend Mass Housing. They have various loan options, a 30-year fixed rate. They will have mortgage insurance. Mass Housing always calls it just MI instead of PMI, but they have discounted mortgage insurance, so it's a little more affordable um, as a first-time home buyer. And in that too is job loss assistance. If you have a gap in employment, um, that MI will cover your principal and your interest for up to six months. So that is a benefit to that. Um, they have a variety of loan options. So I've listed them here, Workforce Advantage 2.0. So if you're 80% area median income, there's some down payment assistance associated with that. Um, and, and that's at a 0% deferred rate. Um, first time home buyer conventional, that's up to 100% area median income. There, that down payment assistance is 50, up to 15,000, but you have to start paying that back right away at a 2% interest rate paid back over 15 years. Um, if you are uh, active duty, veteran, National Guard, reservist, or Gold Star family, um, sort of an alternative to a VA loan is their Operation Welcome Home. And then there's Mass Housing, mass housing Mortgage Conventional. If this is something you think you, um, if one plus Boston or one mortgage doesn't work for you, um, this is a good next step. First, find out if a lender does uh, offer this loan. Um, Cambridge Trust does not at this point. And I actually recommend finding out, getting recommendations either from the folks where you take your first time home buying class or going directly to Mass Housing, uh, calling them. You could see a list of all of their lenders. The Mass Housing is available through um, mortgage companies and banks, uh, but it's hard to know who really does a lot of these and who's good. So I would recommend calling Mass Housing directly to get good recommendations or talking with your um, home buying class folks to get recommendations if this is a loan product that you think is going to be the right one for you. And then I always talk about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, their first time home buyer programs, which are very good. And so this is often sort of the bread and butter in other states. But because, I mean, and we do offer them, but to be honest, Cambridge Trust doesn't do them very much because One Plus Boston and One Mortgage are a million times better and so much more affordable. Um, the, there's income restrictions um, and, you know, it's a low down payment for a condo, a 3% down payment for a condo or a single, but much higher requirements uh, for multifamilies, reserves allowed, and, um, you know, you may find that you go in if you have a 660 credit score, you may be okay, but you may not if you don't have a lot of savings. They're going to look at all the pieces as a whole, and it's so not quite as definite um, as some of the other loan programs in terms of their requirements. They're looking at all of the pieces together, um, and then decisions are made that way. So I recommend it, um, but I'm not selling it because I just don't see people use it very often, to be honest, in Massachusetts colleagues 
who are doing loans with first-time homebuyers up in New Hampshire, we do lending up there, they're using it much more. Um, but I don't really see it so much down here. Um, some different options too. So just to say, various lenders may have what they call portfolio products. That's something they've created and designed and they use their own money to lend you. And then they keep the, the loan and they keep it in house. And so there could be some good first time home buyer loan options um, at different lenders. Again, that is a good thing to ask uh, your first time home buyer program. Do they know of any banks that are doing specific portfolio programs for first time home buyers that could be really useful to you. So something to ask that might have great down payment, um, great terms. It might compete with one mortgage. It might compete with one plus Boston. So something to look into. Um, I always talk about FHA loans because um, it's the common uh, assumption is that the FHA loan is really the first time home buyer loan. If you don't have a big down payment, then that's the way to go. And I would say it's probably the most costly way to go at this point. There will be lower credit score requirements. Uh, the down payment requirement is 3.5% down. But the interest rates are much higher. So I would say at this point, it's likely that they are in the fives. They're gonna be higher than even a regular conventional Fannie or Freddie Mac loan that gets sold on the secondary market. You will be required to pay mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. It does not go away. The only way to stop paying mortgage insurance if you get an FHA loan is if you refinance out of that. Everybody says, oh, I refinanced, I refinanced. But do keep in mind that when you refinance, you will have to pay closing costs. There's always a cost to that. And then you will be set back to the beginning. You will be setting back to another 30-year mortgage. And, um, and when you pay your mortgage, um, the first payment is going to be mostly interest. And every payment from there on out is a little less interest and a little more principal. So when you refinance, you kind of set yourself backwards. And it's not a great way to move forward. And then lastly, with FHA, in terms of being costly, is there is what they call an upfront MIP. And that's a mortgage insurance payment. It's just a flat fee that FHA requires. You pay it at closing, and it's 1.75% of the loan amount. So for example, if you have a loan amount of $300,000, you have to show up with an additional $5,250 to closing, in addition to your down payment, in addition to the other closing costs. So the cost of that is significant. Um, so wherever possible, I do encourage you to, to kind of seek other options. Um, and then I don't know much about VA loans, um, but they are, they are an option, 0% down, no private mortgage insurance, and a fairly low credit score of 620. Um, the only thing I can say is if you think this is something you'd like to do, it is my understanding it's harder to do in Boston and harder with condos, um, but find somebody, find a lender that really does a lot of these. Lenders may say, yeah, we do them, but they don't do them as a matter of course. So that loan originator doesn't know it well, that underwriter doesn't know it well, and it's gonna be a bad experience. Um, you're gonna wanna work with a lender who really, they do a ton. And I think generally, um, any loan program that you decide to go with, find a lender who really does them a lot. And then that's the key. Any questions about any of the loan programs? Um, yeah. um, I don't see any in here, but I did have, I'm not sure if you have it on the next slide, debt to okay. income. Yep. We're what does that, that look like for each one? Sure. Um, so I'm not going to go into the debt to income for each loan program. It's too much. I'm going to talk about it generally. And when you are talking with lenders, I, I recommend that you ask what the ratios are that you qualify for, what you need. Um, but typically, so debt to income, there's a front ratio and a back ratio. So the front ratio is we're really looking at your housing debt. And that means, so when I say 33 to 36, your front ratio is 33 to 36 of gross monthly income towards your PITI. That means, let's just say 33% of your gross income basically going towards your housing payment. So it's that principal and interest and then the amount that gets uh, paid every month that goes into escrow for your property taxes and insurance. So if you have money going in escrow for um, the insurance policy to get renewed, or it might be that you have private mortgage insurance. And then if you have a condo, then it's also gonna factor in that condo fee. 
So 33 to 36%. And I say there's a range because sometimes loans will say, okay, we'll go up to 36% or a lender might say this, but we need some compensating factors. And so some of those compensating factors might be, it might be about property type, it might be job history, you have that two year work history with one employer that can be a compensating factor. Um, your credit score uh, might be a compensating factor, your mix of credit, um, how much down payment, payment shock. There's all these pieces that factor in to each loan. So ask the lender when you're shopping around, when you're talking to lenders to find out what that looks like. Um, and then the back ratio is the total debt. And this also varies by loan program, varies if there's compensating factors or not, let's say anywhere from 38 to 50% and varies by property type. Um, so a condo would really, the most a condo is gonna be is up to 43%. That means 43% of your income can go towards your total minimum monthly debt obligation. So that's your housing debt, it's your housing payments, that principal interest, taxes, insurance, and condo fee, and any other debt you're carrying, um, such as anything on your credit cards, um, anything that's in your credit report, or if you owe um, child support. So that's going to be a debt that you owe that will be factored in there. Um, and then to just kind of get a sense to wrap your head around it, if you take this chart, so what I've just done is saying, okay, if you earn $55,000 a year and your loan allows for ratios of 33, 38, that's saying I don't have any compensating factors, then um, the most that you can do from your income towards your monthly payment for your mortgage payment and your condo fee, is $1,512. Then when you're considering debt, the total allowable debt to get that max amount for the, for the mortgage amount is $1,741. So if we were to subtract that mortgage payment and condo fee from the total allowable debt, that means you could only carry $229 month of monthly debt in order to get that maximum loan amount. If you have higher monthly debt than $229, which is common, if you have credit cards and a car loan and student loans, it's very common. That just, that just means it's gonna impact how much home loan you can qualify for. And the more debt you carry, the lower that loan amount is gonna be. So just kind of keep that in mind um, as you're thinking about this debt to income ratio. And those are the conversations to have with a loan originator and kind of feeling overwhelmed. And then there's an element where you feel like, oh, I wanna figure this out on my own. Um, I would say, I don't figure it out off the top of my head. We have systems where we plug all of your data in to assess what that looks like. So this is definitely one of those cases where if you're not quite sure, it is really good to have seen your credit report. And from that report, you know what your minimum monthly debt obligations are. So for example, if you have a credit card and you owe $2,000 on that credit card, you may pay off. Um, you're like, well, but I usually pay 500, 800, 1,000 every month because you're just using that. But what their lender's looking at is that minimum amount. And so just get that exact amount, each minimum amount. So if you talk with a lender, you could say, I earn $55,000 a year. I have $10,000 saved. I'm going to use some financial assistance. And uh, this is how much um, monthly debt I have and then they can give you an estimate. So that's something when you wanna do just that verbal pre-qualification, just to get a ballpark. But the more exact you can have the numbers, the better that estimate is going to be for you. And, um, and do keep in mind, um, one of the things that has sort of been um, challenging, even though we understand why it happened, is the federal government, when COVID came into play, put everybody's student loans into forbearance. So nobody's been paying and the amount that gets pulled onto the credit reports is zero. But the unintended consequence is when you're applying for a loan, the lender is in fact required, these are Fannie Mae guidelines and those are the guidelines followed um, that we take 1% of the total amount of debt owed 
as your minimum monthly debt obligation to use for your loan application or your pre-approval application. So for example, I've worked with a number of people, they have a lot of debt, they may be doing work where it's gonna get forgiven, they're gonna pay it off over time, they're doing income-based payments, but I look at it and I say, oh, I'm gonna to have to use 1%. Somebody might have $100,000 in debt, so that means I have to use $1,000 worth of student loan debt as their minimum monthly debt obligation. And at that point, they qualify for maybe $25,000 home loan. So, but what we can do, as long as you have a statement with what your payment will be, was or will be, or some sort of documentation, then we can utilize that as the um, student loan payment for those purposes. Um, so far, it looks like that's going to go away at the end of the May, end of May, but we'll see. Who knows if they're going to keep it um, or not? They've extended it a bunch of times so far, so we just don't know. But kind of keep that in mind. Um, also, one thing just to mention too on credit is that if you have co-signed for anything, you know, I've I've um, worked with folks. They co-signed on a car loan for a family member, they co-signed for student loans for their kids, they've co-signed, even though you're not paying it and the bills are going to the other person who got the loan, it still shows up as your debt. Um, so I've had to talk with people, they've had to get off of those loans, they've had to kind of get that removed. So keep in mind that co-signing debt for other folks can have an impact as well. Um, and so we, anything so far with, um, with that slide? Yes. Okay. So move back. For the slide before, one more, I think. Where it talks about front end and back end ratios. Yeah. So if you have no other consumer debt, all you're gonna have is the mortgage. So everything else is zero. Why is it that your your ratio can't just be based off of the back end? So like now your front end can go up to the 38 or the 50% because you don't have any consumer debt, but that's a back end ratio. So could I be pre approved for more because I have no debt? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can speculate on why the rule was implemented. You could get debt later. You may not have it now, but you can get it later. But um, the front ratio, you're it's not going to go beyond that. I mean, so in the past, there has been more of that. And you may find more flexibility on that with some of your regular conventional loans. But I can tell you Cambridge Trust will not do more than 36%. This, and also keep in mind, this is for a condo and a single, and I didn't clarify this. So this does sort of bring this piece up. If you are buying a multifamily, they are less um, focused on staying to that 30% gross monthly income front ratio. So multifamily could, can be different. So it can be higher. Yeah, it can be higher. Okay. Because they're factoring in that um, income coming from those um, rental units. But otherwise, um, a condo and a single, no more than 36%. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then you're welcome. It ties into this um, and, and just clarification. What's the difference between a co-borrower and a co-signer? Um, and how that plays into all of these numbers. Uh, when mm -hmm. you're buying a home? So for a mortgage, for a loan, a co-borrower is somebody who's going to be on that mortgage with you and is going to be on the note, the promissory note, and on the deed and live in the property. They are owning, buying and owning that property together. Say a car loan, you might have been a co-signer so that somebody could get a car loan because they didn't have enough credit or something like that. You have no obligation to that other than the fact that if they don't pay, then um, you're obligated. If you, uh, we don't do co-signers on, um, on our loans, but there are, you can get loans where somebody might come and co-sign for you, um, but it would be a very different kind of loan. That's not really something, you are not gonna find that option to have a co-signer with a first time home buyer mortgage. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have, I didn't see any questions in the chat. So I was just asking kind of my questions. I know people have asked in the past. Do you guys have any questions before we move on? This is your chance. You're talking to the lender to know what you need. <laughs> 10 more seconds for something to enter the chat and then we're moving on. 
because I'm okay. going to assume you guys have it. All right. Up uh, for mass housing, the down payment assistance. You said that they would. You it's two percent interest. Does that now count towards your DTI, your debt to income, in that all of this? Back, yes, that becomes additional debt and is factored in your into your debt to income ratio. So it does impact how much loan amount you qualify for. Okay. Um, and then here someone asked, what's the perfect or what's the best credit score for a conventional loan? So if you're what's doing a conventional loan? loan where say it's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac regular loan that can get sold on the secondary market, I think you're gonna want a credit score of 740 or above. If it's lower, it doesn't mean you won't get the loan, but you may have to have um, more money saved. You may have to show more assets. You may have to do a higher down payment, um, that type of thing. Okay. All right, so the lending team. So you start out, you work with a loan originator um, through pre-approval, through loan application process. They are gonna be your right-hand person um, who you're working with. Once you have a loan application submitted, you are also going to be working with a loan assistant. That loan assistant supports the loan originator and the loan processor. They're going to be gathering documentation, asking questions, loan, you know, loan originator, is this what you really meant? Do you mean this? Making sure everything looks good. Um, it's kind of like another set of eyes, asking for some additional documentation and kind of moving everything forward. Then it gets pushed over to the loan processor. And really they comb through and they get everything ready for underwriting. And this is the person that you will work with probably most significantly through the loan process. One of the things to think about um, at Cambridge Trust, we work as a team. So once you move to that loan process, you're not gonna hear from me quite as much. You're gonna hear mostly a bit from the um, loan assistant and then processor, but I'm included in all communications and we actually include each other. So when anything is requested or anything's happened, we all know what's going on. If there's questions or challenges, you can always reach out to that loan originator and be like, I don't understand what's happening here. Do I do this? Do I do that? Um, but we work together as a team. The underwriter is kind of kept separate um, we do have access and we, uh, you know, like I know our underwriter, I know her personally, I see her when there's questions and concerns, we can talk about it, which is a good thing. You won't have direct access to the underwriter. Sometimes people wish they could, um, but really it's the processor that kind of works through and asks for documents and asks for uh, clarifications. And then when you get to the end, there's a closer. And the closer is really working with the bank attorney to make sure that all the numbers and everything is correct to get you your closing disclosure. So all those pieces are in place, what everything that needs to happen and gets you your closing disclosure three days before closing. And that's the document that you get that you see all the details of all the costs, which is important to go through. And you're gonna be like, what is going on here? You can review that with your attorney. You can follow up and ask questions. You can ask them of the um, loan originator to kind of help you understand all of those pieces. And then that's how you know exactly how much you need to bring to closing. Oftentimes when people are getting financial assistance, they have just paid their one and a half percent towards the down payment and they don't need to bring anything to closing, but you find out kind of at that end and you work with the closing attorney in terms of how they want that uh, payment provided. It could be a cashier's check, it could be they want it wired. So you kind of work on all those last minute pieces. Where is the closing going to be and all of that. So that's sort of the team that all works together. Um, you know, you might want to consider um, where is, uh, you know, where is the lending team? Where is your, your bank? Is it a big bank? Where is underwriting? Is it local? Is it in another state? Do they understand um, the dynamics, do they understand your market? Uh, is there a team that can all work together? There's very often times people say, well, what problems could arise? It's a variety of things. And if you have a team that can kind of work together to kind of get everything closed, that's a benefit to you as a borrower. Um, but no matter where that lender is, just know that both the lender, the bank or the mortgage company and the loan originator must be licensed. We have all had, uh, you know, huge background checks done on us. 
We are licensed and we all have a NMLS number. That's a National Multi-State Licensing System and Registry. So you can look us up. I've provided the address and you can see, okay, here's the website. Let me see if there's been any issues or challenges with either the institution itself or this loan originator. Um, and so I've provided both that for Cambridge Trust and for myself. So this should be on pretty much all correspondence. And then just keeping in mind, and I know you've had a ton thrown at you, so if you don't remember all of this, this is okay. I know I would not. Um, when you first start a loan application, you're going to get a loan estimate. So this is a formal document that is required by the federal government, and it's to give you a sense of the cost of that loan, the cost of buying a home. There's going to be some additional things on it, like you know estimates for home inspections, estimates for the cost of a home buying class. You're not going to pay those at the end. That's just to give you a bigger picture of what it's going to cost to buy this home. You're going to get a host of consumer protections and toolkits and books and all kinds of information, a lot of which, if you've taken a home buying class, which you will have, you've already gotten, so lots of information. Um, it also is going to have an intent to proceed. So just know that you do, once you get that loan estimate, you then need it to again tell that lender, yes, I want to move forward with this loan application. And it's at that point that you say, yes, I want to move forward. And they'll say, great, we need some money for the appraisal. Uh, final key items. You need to have enough money uh, to get a homeowner's insurance policy for a single or multifamily. You may need to get a policy for a condo that will cost uh, less, um, that won't be as much. And that's gonna be determined by the uh, master insurance. So during that process, the seller will provide the information, the condo docs and master insurance. And that kind of gets figured out during the process if you're gonna need that policy or not. You're going to get a closing disclosure three days prior. So we talked a bit about this. Um, and then you're going to know how much cash you need to close. And a really key thing is verification. So throughout the process, we will always re-verify. So from the point of pre-approval to the point to when you sign on the line at closing, you need to make sure that your application kind of stays the same. Don't change jobs. So I say really in big caps, do not change jobs which factors doesn't exactly tie into what I said earlier is we're not here to hold you back from job opportunities, but communicate with your loan originator, find out because if you are in the middle of a loan application job, loan application and you have a closing, let's just say it's you know the 23rd uh, of March and you're closing, let's just say in two weeks, if you change jobs, you will never be able to close in two weeks because you won't have that uh, verification. You won't, we won't be able to verify that you actually are gonna have income and that your job is going to continue. So make sure to talk with and plan and work through that. Don't just change jobs and not tell them. Um, credit will be, ref we say refresh. So it's not gonna be a full hard pull again at the end, but they're gonna look, have you, have you put a bunch of stuff on your credit cards? Common things, it's not uncommon, is to buy appliances and furniture. 0% um, interest. Jordan's has the 0% interest. Not saying don't do it, but I am saying if you do it before you close, you now are going to have that debt and your debt to income ratios may not work. And I have seen people uh, lose their homes and uh, put everything at risk because they no longer qualify for the loan. So wait until after you close to make any large purchases. Again, live your most boring life. Do not increase that debt in any way, shape, or form. Um, because if you make any changes to your loan application, it's going to have to be reevaluated. Changing jobs is changing your loan application. Increasing that debt is changing that loan application. So just kind of keep that in mind because you have a contract with that seller that purchase and sale agreement that has specific dates by which you have agreed to do things. And we as a bank are trying to work as hard to meet those deadlines as possible, because if you can't meet them, it does put your, um, your assets, your deposits at risk. Um, also, you should talk at your home buying class, talk more about what that, um, what that risk looks like uh, with the attorney. And that is the end of my presentation. That was awesome. Uh, very, very informative. Um, guys, do you have any questions? Please put them in the chat. If you're trying to think of the question, put a question mark so I know it's coming. Um, 
but Michelle, thank you so much for providing um, so much information. I'm going to upload this um, onto YouTube and share it with you guys. So if it was too much to digest because it was just for going, you have an opportunity to go back, press pause, digest the information, um, and kind of move forward. So you guys will have a copy of this um, by the end of the week um, so that you can rewatch it. Um, I think for me, it's trying to understand for just lending in general across different lenders, do they have, do lenders have different debt to income requirements and credit score requirements, or is there a standard based on loan products? Um, it might vary a bit. They may have uh, what the lender will call it an overlay. So for example, one mortgage, and I don't think I said this, so this is a good question. Um, one mortgage, has the guideline that it's a 640 credit score for a single or a condo and a 660 for a multi. Cambridge Trust has an overlay requirement of 660 and 680. Um, and then our debt to income, we go no higher on the front ratio than 36. I don't know if other lenders go higher than that. If they do, I would say no higher than 38, um, but it is worth um, asking. Perfect, thank you. No other questions, guys? Okay, and then do you guys have portfolio loans or do you do FHA loans as well? We do not do FHA. We do have a portfolio loan, but it's not, I would say if it's at 60% area median income, we don't actually use it as often because of the benefits of one mortgage and one plus Boston. Makes sense. Okay. So if there are no further questions, Michelle, thank you again um, for being so informative in this process. Um, and guys, we're going to kind of create a checklist for you to go along with this presentation so you understand what you need, right? You know the credit score that, the minimum credit score that you need. I tell everyone, even though it's a 640, aim for a 680. If you have a 680, then we're still going for a 700. Always try to get it as high as possible, but 680 gives you enough wiggle room for when lenders start pulling your credit for that pre-approval, you're gonna take a dip. You'll still be above the minimum that they need. Um, making sure that your debt to income is where it needs to be. You know the numbers now, go back and track your, your, your debt to income, see where that lands and what you need to work on. Um, Michelle gave you, you know, it's about $16,000 that you need if you're trying to purchase a home that's $300,000, right? I tell people start at 10 and keep increasing. So give yourself goals and benchmarks so you know kind of to keep on track to hit your target. Um, so we're going to have more of those um, or that information for you guys in our 90 day home challenge. I'll send you guys the email for the link if you have not joined it and you think you need that additional support. But the goal is, again, just to help you guys stay on track with some of these things to make sure um, when it is time to apply for a mortgage, you'll be OK. Um, we don't want you to you know, decide you're going to apply and then you find out that your debt to income is at 60. You're not buying anything at that point. Um, so we want to make sure we address those things beforehand. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, have a wonderful evening and, um, yeah, be blessed. Thank you, Denisha.